your opportunity to listen and learn from the most successful people driving growth and success in Palm Beach County and beyond. Welcome to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Carrie Stamp, founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principled Wealth Advisors. Carrie and his guests share stories and insights from Palm Beach County's most successful executives, entrepreneurs, and community leaders. Learn how they made it to where they are today, what principles guide them, how they mentor others to achieve success, and more. Hi, my name is Carrie Stamp, and this is the Business in Paradise podcast. On this podcast, we interview interesting people that have built phenomenal businesses in the Palm Beach and Martin County area. I have a fantastic guest today. My guest has been in this area for a very long time, and a lot of people know him. Uh, Jeff Leslie is the CEO of What's it called now, Jeff? ITS Telecom? ITS Fiber. ITS Fiber, I'm sorry. And ITS stands for what? ITS. It used to be Indian Town Telephone System. Uh, The company has roots that go back 80 years, and it was the original uh, telephone company of Western Martin County, and uh, like I say, about 80 years ago it started. So how did that come about? How were these uh, local telephone companies started and how did somebody just kind of become the owner of a a telephone company? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. Again, goes back 80 years. In in Florida, you don't hear as much about these independent telephone companies. You just generally hear about the big guys. But throughout our country, there's a lot of rural areas where the big guys just decided that there's just no way they could ever make a living trying to provide telephone services. If you had to build $200,000 worth of cable to get to a customer to give them a $5 a month telephone line, it just didn't work. And so the federal government subsidized a bunch of these companies. There's probably about 2,000 of them in our country, but they're very concentrated up in like Iowa and Indiana and South Dakota and that type of thing. There's only four or five of them here in the state of Florida. So what happened is, and I guess it's still unclear exactly how it came came to be, but it's my understanding that it originally was uh, one of the big companies that provided services to to Indian Town in Martin County. And there was a hurricane that came. Everybody was down, didn't have any telephone service in Indian Town. One guy came along and uh, since the big company wouldn't give them any attention, He said, that's it. I'm going to the Public Service Commission. We're starting a telephone company. So they did ever since. Started in a a place out there called the uh, Seminole Inn in the gift shop, which which is presently the gift shop of the Seminole Inn. I've been to the Seminole Inn. I've had lunch there. It's uh, quite a blast from the past kind of a place. That's pretty cool. So Jeff, in the small world category, I grew up in Iowa. And when I started my career, I think I I mentioned to you earlier that I started working for a firm that was called Piper, Jaffrey, and Hopwood at that time. As I was starting my career, one of the first things that uh, that happened to me, I was making cold calls. And I would literally take the phone book from a small town and just start calling people. I ended up calling the manager of the telephone company in a little town called Brooklyn, Iowa. (laughs) And uh, we became friends. And it was called Brooklyn Cooperative Telephone Association or something like that. And I eventually even had a small office in the telco office. They were, I was in the back by where, where they had the switches. And I became a subscriber to this mutual telephone company and, every, and I would pay my bill every month. And at the end of the year, they would send me a check. Yeah. And it was usually more than what I paid for my bill because they were selling their switch services to uh, other parties. I, as a rookie broker, I was probably 24 years old, got in my car and drove around the state of Iowa to probably 50 or 60 rural telephone offices, knocked on the door, walked in and asked to talk to the manager because all of these telecom companies had big retained earnings in their portfolios. And I was selling bonds to these companies almost 30 years ago. So coming full circle now to meeting one of the guys that has a uh, Florida telco, 
that is almost exactly the same as in Iowa. However, most of the Iowa ones are mutually owned. There's a few privately owned ones, but there's a lot of mutual ones. So Jeff, when did you decide that you were going to become a telecom or telco owner? And how did that come about? Well, it's pretty much the story of my life. I always end up doing the things I never expected I would ever think of doing. You know, I started out uh, out of college, went to FAU because I grew up in this area and uh, went to FAU and uh, went to work with Arthur Anderson and Company out of, out of college and was a CPA and I did that and I got involved after I left Arthur Anderson, I went to work for a uh, bank, a large banking group out of Boca Raton and eventually became Bank America, was a part of Bank America with, after about four or five different acquisitions uh, later. And uh, I had then went to become uh, my own CPA firm, and I uh, had a CPA firm in Northern Palm Beach and Martin Counties. Did that for several years. And it was really kind of funny because I had developed some experience in my, with Arthur Anderson, did a lot of banking work, went work for some banks. When I developed my own CPA practice, I did a lot of water and sewer utilities for some reason. And uh, there was a lot of them, independents in uh, Martin County, and I kind of got very involved with that, did a lot of work with the PSC and helping these small water and sewer utilities. Well, it was a very interesting thing because I always used to go out to Indian Town and just try to see, hey, do you guys need a good CPA out here, you know, because they had a bank and they had a lot of things out there. They never gave me much attention, but I went to lunch a couple times with the president of the bank out there. Then one day I got this phone call. The owner of, there was an owner that owned a lot of the different companies in Indian Town, actually owned most of Indian Town. The water, the sewer, the garbage, the telephone, the bank, restaurants, construction companies, dredging companies, re- you name it, land, owned pretty much, when, when you went to Indian Town, you pretty well had to pay your penance to, uh, to one person out there. He called me and said, I understand you've had some banking experience as a CPA and everything. Well, we've got a bank out here and we're, we're in trouble. We got a big problem on Monday, and this was on a Wednesday, he said, the banking, uh, finance and banking for uh, the state of Florida is going to come down and they may give us a cease and desist because we made a bunch of loans that probably weren't the kind we should be making. And he said, do you think you could come out and help us figure something out here? And I said, yeah. And so I uh, went out there Wednesday and I worked around the clock all the way till Monday morning and met with the examiners from the state and told them that, hey, it's not quite as bad as you guys think. And as a result, we were able to get it to a memorandum of understanding rather than a cease and desist. I spent the next two years trying to get this bank uh, totally been recasting it, rebuilding it. We got it turned around, started doing a really good job. And it's a long story. (laughs) But what happened is, is the guy who owned all those companies said, well, would you come out and run all my companies? And I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. They kept after me for a couple of years. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And so I went out and I was the COO, CFO, and everything in between, probably running about 20 different companies in Indian town. But when the owner passed away, I liquidated all those companies and I purchased the telephone company, which I'd been working at as one of my companies for about 10 years, also the water and sewer company. So, uh, That's kind of a long story on how it got there, but it was really, really crazy how it happened. So this was never anything that you envisioned. It was just like uh, fortuitous, a stroke of fate. This just just happened, one of those things. Yeah, it it was in in some ways, you know, but it's just something I'd never really been scared of any kind of business. uh, When I was with Arthur Anderson and my own firm and everything, we did all types of companies. I was probably more of a consulting type CPA rather than just a debit and credit type guy. I never really got much into those details. I just had the confidence that, you know, look, I'll figure this out. That's what we did. When they called you and said, Jeff, we've heard you've had some banking experience and we want you to come out and help us out with this. Were you really at a point where you felt comfortable like, yeah, I got this, I can handle this? Or was it, okay, I want to take this on. So this is my opportunity. I'm going to uh, step up to the plate. 
Well, I think it was maybe somewhere in between. I was definitely very confident. It didn't bother me at all, but it was really blind confidence. Yeah. <laughs> I probably didn't know what I was doing, but we did it and it worked out right. And one thing led to the other. And that's uh, where we ended up with a telephone call. All right. I want to get the timeline right now. Did you grow up in South Florida? I did. I'm a Riviera Beach boy, which is kind of interesting. You know, I went to Suncoast High School when it was not an a, a IB program back then. I was there the first year it became Suncoast High School. My kids are, are always funny. Their, their friends would say, oh, Mr. Leslie, you, you must have been really smart to go to Suncoast. <laughs> I said, well, quite that way when I went there. Yes, I did all my life. I've lived here since I was a child. My family actually came from Ohio, but I was a baby when they came here. So I've grown up I've been to almost every school in Northern County because my family's lived in Jupiter, Juneau, Riviera Beach, North Palm Beach, Palm Beach Gardens, which has really been a great thing for me. And I, I really has added to the success that I've had is all the relationships I've built with all the people, mostly in the North County. All right. And so you uh, go to Suncoast High School and then immediately to FAU? Yes. And we do an undergrad degree in accounting, or do we get an advanced degree in accounting after the FAU? Well, actually, I went to Palm Beach Junior College, Peanut okay. Butter and Jelly College at okay. the time, for my first two years. And uh, I was actually thinking about going to UF. I always had desired to go to UF. But I had one of the world's greatest jobs at that time. I was a captain of a sailboat. There was a a wealthy gentleman who uh, bought a sailboat, lived up in Ohio, came down here from November to March. He asked me, to, would I be his captain? And uh, so I would sail them around while they are here from November to March. And in the uh, summers, it was my boat. I could take it to the Bahamas. He paid for everything. And so I had the world's best job back then. So I decided FAU is definitely the place I'm not going anywhere. How old were you at the time? You're the boat captain? 17 years old. 17 years old, and you're the captain of the guy's boat? Yes. Oh, yes. my gosh. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good gig for 17. I was cutting uh, grass and shoveling snow. <laughs> I think you, you just won best uh, teenage job right there. Okay, so we're out of FAU, and along the way, you meet a woman and get married? Yes. Uh, actually, I was married before I went to FAU. I met my wife, Diane, at, at church. Okay. We got married young. It was just one of those things. We dated for about a year, and uh, you know, the rest was history. Wow. Okay. So you get married young, and then you have some kids along the way. Yes. Right? Yes. So your, your kids came when, were you living in Jupiter? Where, where, were, where were you when the kids came? I was actually living in the northern part of West Palm Beach when they first started coming, and I was working at Arthur Anderson, was gone all the time. I used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, drive to Miami, work all day, get home at midnight. My wife would wake my first daughter up when I would get home at midnight so I could spend an hour with her, and I did that about six days a week. Finally decided that that's got to go. That's when I moved on and left the big eight at that time. And you told me something that just blew me away earlier. You said that all four of your children are CPAs, four yes. for four CPAs. <laughs> yes. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's not something I ever pushed them to do, but we always had something. I always believed when I went to college that if I, I always had an affinity for being in business. And I just felt when I went that the best thing that I could do was to was to do accounting because I felt that I could get the, the most education in business that way. And that's probably the one thing I told them, but all four of them are CPAs. All four have worked for their first jobs were national CPA firms. And you also told me that even though dad had his own business, mm-hmm. you thought that it was important for your children to go out and uh, work for somebody else in the world. Explain your philosophy behind that. It's something that I, you know, I, I, it's probably neither right or wrong, but uh, having been a CPA and dealt with a lot of different people and financial and their families and things like that, it just seemed there were a lot of people whose kids were somewhat handicapped because they never really had to go out and, and earn it on their own. And that, I think there's, there's good, good in that and there's also bad in that. And I just kind of determined myself that I really wanted my kids to 
have to go out and, and earn it. I wanted them to get beat up. I wanted to work for that uh, manager that didn't treat them right. And I wanted them to overcome it. You know, it, it has been a good thing for me. Like, again, there's nothing wrong with, you know, second generation and everything like that. A lot of people handle it probably a lot better than I could have ever done it. But uh, it really has worked out good because they're all self-sufficient, all in very uh, good jobs and doing well. Wow. So in, in some ways, you're almost an accidental entrepreneur, but I guess I would say that you started a CPA practice before you acquired the, the telecom company and the water and sewer company. If you were talking to your kids, and I think most of your children are entrepreneurial in some fashion or another, is there any common advice that you would give them as they think about building their business and building their careers? Having a strong faith is, <laughs> if you own a business, having a strong faith is an important thing. There's a lot of nights I probably wouldn't have slept without my faith, you know, with what you have to go through. Uh, working hard is obviously a very important thing. And, and there is one thing that I've always told them. There was one time in my career where I got sued for uh, 20 counts of what was fraud, fraud, basically. I've always really, you know, valued integrity. I'm a strong Christian man. I've always tried to live it every day. And and I was very confident I had never violated, you know, my conscience in that regard. So when I got into this, it was actually, I guess I shouldn't get into the details of, of how it got into it, but it really was nothing to do with me. It was more so that someone else had a problem. They just brought me in hoping that I would speak up about the other person. Anyway, they, they went through every email, every document, everything I'd ever done for the last, my entire life. I mean, they went through everything. The opposing group. They went through it all. And I'm just kept always wondering, man, you know, I know I never really, you know, did anything inappropriate, but boy, it scares you to death when that happens. Long story short, when we got towards the end of it, there came a mediation. They brought me in first before they brought in the other party who did have some culpability in this. They said, well, you can go. And I was like, oh, really? And they said, yes, there's absolutely nothing that we found in all that stuff about you. And so one of the things I've always told my kids, and I've told a lot of the young guys that I mentor in my business, is that, you know, there's a lot of decisions you have to make about what you do each day. And all you really have to worry about is the next decision and doing it right. What I relied on and, and was the case is that the sum of the parts of all good decisions come out to be a good decision. And so you should never have to worry about sleeping at night or anything like that. And, and that was just proof of it. And so I've always warned them, just do the right thing for the next little one and the next little one and the next little one and just one at a time. It'll work out. You know, Jeff, one of the things I always ask the guests on the podcast is if they have a personal or business mantra that they live by. And I think you just gave that to me. That's just do the right thing every single time and make the next right decision. That's really, really uh, phenomenal information. You know, quite frankly, you never have to look over your shoulder and you never have to rack your brains for what you might have done wrong if you just make the right decision, even if it costs you money mm -hmm. and even if it's painful at that particular moment to own up. And sometimes we make mistakes mm -hmm. and uh, to deny a mistake that you made and not own up to it, well, you, you might get uh, some short-term relief, but in the long run, you've got to live with yourself and what you've done and it'll always, always come back to bite you. Exactly. Yeah. Along the way, you, you mentioned mentoring, that you mentor some young, younger people in your business. I want to ask you about who has impacted you and the types of people over your career that you look back on and you say, geez, these people have had a profound impact on who I became as, as a human being in business, in faith, in, in uh, uh, things that you're doing. Who, who would you give some credit to, Jeff? the standard uh, athletic guy after the game, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> there's no question. You know, I try to pat, I really try to pattern myself. I really try to live it, you know, fail a lot. But the thing is, is that it's uh, a guiding principle and the highest that there can be. And so I, I think that's it. I've also really tried to pay attention to some of the people that I've worked with. I have right now someone that I still mentor with. I'm in a Vistage group. The chairman of our Vistage group has been a big impact on my life. 
has helped me uh, through the times that got tough uh, as I went towards purchasing my company and as I went building it, you know, it's really tough when you don't have any money <laughs> and you've got to uh, do things, you know, and it's always nice to have someone that you can look up to uh, that, that's been there and done that to be able to say, uh, there's a, a guy that I used to go to church with that built a company I was so impressed with all my life. He built a big refrigeration company. The one thing that was so cool that when I was younger and I saw about him is that everybody that I ever ran into that was his customer just said, man, that is the greatest guy they've ever met. What a great man. And it's kind of interesting because we've had somewhat of a, a similar experience because I know there was a time where he got sued. I remember that the attorney said, look, this guy is as white as snow. You're really wasting your time. And they dropped the lawsuit. And that's just the kind of guy he was. Just what you said earlier, Carrie, is just so important. I mean, I've put it all on the line many times to try to do the right thing. It never fails. You can't build what you're building on, you know, the old house on the sand type thing. You got to build it on a strong foundation. And lots of people, and lots of companies trying to cut corners or maybe not pay their taxes or, or do whatever like that. And, you know, they just never are going to reach the level of success that they could reach by trying to do it right. It takes longer, probably in some cases, but in the long run, you know, it's the rabbit and it's the uh, turtle and the hare. And Jeff, you, you touched on something a moment ago that I want to go back to, and that's the Vistage group or the mastermind group. And it's no secret to my listeners that I'm also in a Vistage group. And by the time this podcast goes live, there will be a podcast out with our Vistage group leader, State Signs. And States has been an influential person in my life and a great mentor to me as well. Tell us a little bit about how Vistage has impacted your life, being part of a mastermind type of a group and what that's meant to you. I don't think I'm saying anything anybody doesn't know, but the, the fact is, is that sometimes it gets a little lonely at the top. You know, when you're running the company, you have to make these decisions all the time and you haven't always had the experiences to, to know what to do. You think you do, and, and uh, you know, I've often found myself using the zipper method, which means I move in one direction. Maybe I'm not afraid to make the decision, but then, you know, you have to correct. You, know, you have to correct to get to the goal you're going to get. I'm going to get to the goal, but it's just how you get there. And, you know, to be able to share with the people who have had experiences, you know, different experiences that are CEOs, you always need to be learning. And uh, there's so much, you know, if uh, I know in my life when I've, decided to just open myself up and listen and, and recognize that I don't have the answers, you know, all the answers, how much you can learn and grow and uh, being able to share that experience with other CEOs. It's basically CEO training that you can't always go to your subordinates and say, well, how do I make this big decision? You know, rather than doing it alone, how great it is to have a guy like States who's got great experience in, in very, you know, sizable areas and then have a group of what 12 or 16 guys that that are out there doing the same thing you're doing and have to make those same decisions and sharing and it's just like you know having your own board of directors of guys that really know all about you and what you're doing absolutely it's been incredibly valuable on my progression too jeff do you have somebody that you really look up and admire to that you would say this is this is somebody that i think is is really phenomenal and done a tremendous job of changing the world you know, first of all, my mom been just a, such an incredible hero of mine. Her positive, she's one of the most positive people I've ever met. I've never met anybody that's matched her positiveness. She is uh, someone that I really, really respect. It's, it's kind of funny growing up here in uh, Northern Palm Beach County, there's some people that played a lot of youth sports, okay, all the way through high school. Just basically everybody I grew up with, it was, you know, from baseball to basketball to football, and you never stop. And there was people uh, like a guy named Joe Gaffney and Roy Crocker that were uh, just incredibly, everybody worshipped them, all the kids growing up, you know. Mr. Crocker coached a Legion team and caught the pitchers with his bare hands, you know, never even bothered them. Uh, one night, he played the king in his court. They had a softball team come and play the Riviera Beach All-Stars. So th they, they struck out everybody on the All-Star team, and they said, is there anybody in the stands that think they can hit our pitcher from the king of the court? 
And so Mr. Crocker sitting up in the stands and he said, that's it. He goes down, grabs a bat, gets up in front of the guy, bam, hits a ball to the fence, throws the bat down, walks back into the crowd. And so there's just a lot of great people. And, you know, it's, uh, I guess if I had more time to think about, there's a lot more, but yeah. uh, I want to focus on your mom, an uplifting person in in your life. Yes especially when you need to make a phone call and have somebody cheer you up. Yes. Uh, I can often call my mother to do that. And she tells me how great I am. <laughs> Sometimes when my wife doesn't want to tell me, my mother will tell me how, <laughs> yeah. how much she likes me. Good old mom. Yeah. Transforming back to uh, being in Indian town, you yeah. built this business or you bought the business and then you grew it. And it grew because technology changed. I would imagine a lot in the time that you've owned ITS. Tell us about some of the major changes and the things that happened during your tenure. Well, when I purchased the company, it was probably about six months from going out of business. So I had to make some decisions quickly. And one of the first decisions I made was that I needed to borrow money and build fiber because fiber was the future at that particular time. And not many people, no one really was serving anybody on fiber. We had some fiber in the ground. We were mostly copper company. I was able to get a government loan to go out and overbuild our entire network with fiber. And uh, one of the greatest decisions that we ever made because it was the future. Once we got that built, people like uh, Martin County had made a decision that they needed to go to fiber. And so they wanted to connect to us and they built out most of Eastern Martin County. We had most of Western Martin County. And so then we had quite a sizable network working together on that. With the fiber was the, was the thing that opened, opened things up. We were the first company to actually provide fiber, underground fiber broadband in South Florida. And one of the things, or in South Florida, but most importantly, Northern Palm Beach County and uh, Martin County, one of the things that was important to uh, me at the time was the fact that our competitors, as you know, being a telephone company, there's some pretty big competitors, you know, cable companies and telephone companies that we all know about and everything. And so in building our company, I knew that we had to be different and be unique compared to them or otherwise, even if we could outperform them initially, eventually they have the capital and all the means by which to do whatever they needed to do to surpass us at some point. So we started from the beginning saying, one thing we want to capitalize is we're going to be all fiber. We're going to be all underground. Most, those companies today, even to this day, are not all underground fiber. And that's really a particularly good selling point from the standpoint that here we live in a hurricane area and what happens to telephone poles and everything every time you have a hurricane. So reliability was our most important thing. And even though we didn't have a lot of capital one of the things that I did and prayed about every night was, I'm just going to do this the way it has to be done to be done right and just pray that the cash flow works out and that we get the customers and it all works out. So we built the fiber and so we were able to provide broadband and not only broadband, but we we're able to do it symmetrically, which means same up and down speeds, which was different. So reliability. And then the other thing that I recognized that our competitors were not the best at was customer service. And that's something that I have an obsession for is that I am just obsessed about making sure that a customer believes that they got more than what they expected. And there's an interesting story about that. When I was trying to convey to my customers or to my employees what, you know, what that meant, I decided that we would change our mission statement to two words which was noticeably better because so many companies have a mission statement, but every employee in their company doesn't understand it or know it or, or whatever. And when it comes down to making decisions, you need to know that you're within your mission. And so we came up with the thing that our mission statement was just going to be changed to those two words, noticeably better. Now that was really important to us because when you're providing internet or water and sewer or telephone, it's almost a commodity, you know, in some places it is. So how, how could it be noticeably better with that same commodity product? So I brought everybody in one day and I said, here's what noticeably better is going to mean for us. And uh, since I had my water and sewer people there as well as the telephone people there, I said, you know how when you flush the toilet, you push that little, you know, you do your business, you know, you, you flush that little thing and water goes round and round, just goes out. When you do that, it's not really all that eventful. And I said, 
here's what we're going to do. Whenever some of that guy goes and does his thing and, and pushes that little lever and that water goes washing around, we want it to be so fantastic that everybody looks and said, did you see that? And, I, and so they got the point. It's like, we're going to go obsessive about our customer service. And it's, that was an important thing because in our area, we didn't always get the customer first time because we didn't have the big name. But when reliability and great customer service and all those things to the people that mattered to, they wanted to come to us. And uh, we won their, their business. The other thing was, is that I realized that, you know, what is going to happen when there's 5G, and, you know, or 6G or 8G or whatever, and, you know, when will they surpass us? And so we wanted to try to concentrate our efforts on doing things as a broadband company that would have people coming to us because we were who we were, not just because of our commodity product. So we built one of the first commercial data centers in Martin County. We, so we then had underground fiber end to end to a data center. One of the probably most important things in our success is I have always hired the absolute best people we could possibly find. And, and I got to admit, I've never hired one person that I could afford. Every person I hired is like, how am I going to pay for this guy? But we had to have the best people because if we, because I certainly wasn't smart enough to, to figure all this out. And so getting the best people, I've never hired a person who was the best I could possibly find that I could never afford. I never hired a person that it wasn't too long after I said, how could have I afforded never to have hired that person because of what they were able to do to make things happen. So we hired a tremendously talented group of people that, that knew their stuff. And so we added the data center, data center services, IT services, equipment, uh, leasing, being able to provide. We came up with a concept of instead of having people buy new servers and equipment and things, that basically they could buy it from us as a service so that there was very little if no capital up front was necessary in order to be able to get the kind of equipment and reliability and the things that they needed in their networks. So we actually have kind of progressed from being a telephone company to a broadband company. And now we're really about ready to start building ourselves as, as, as an IT company that provides broadband and telephone and, and all the cloud services and, and uh, those type of things. That has made us unique from our competitors and has really kind of moved the needle to where people come to us because we're us more. And then uh, we just hope they'll allow us to give them those commodity products because they appreciate us. Wow. Jeff, the name of the podcast is Business in Paradise. And the reason why I called it that is because I chose to move here. I came from Chicago. I moved to South Florida. You've chosen to stay. Tell me what you like about doing business and living in Palm Beach and Martin County. Well, one thing, having grown up here, and as I told you, I've been about in every school in North County at one time or the other growing up because my parents moved around the, the northern part of the county. I just got to know so many people. This helps with success is relationships. It, it comes down to if you treat people right and you build those relationships, it's not only, you know, what a great job you do or anything like that, but people like to deal with people they like to, to and they know, and, and they have great relationships with. So I've had a great benefit in the fact that I've known so many people. Actually, my grandfather actually lived in Hope Sound uh, back in the late, uh, I guess it'd be the early, late 50s, early 60s. And so our family has really been North County, South Martin County type people. And so we've, we've met a lot of people. You know, we also, being a, a sailboat captain, you know, I grew up at the pump house over in Riviera Beach in the Amaryllis. And and for those who've been around a while, and Singer Island, and, you know, we've lived here, and it's just been such, it's just such a great place to live. It's kind of funny, because even my kids wouldn't even think about going uh, north of about Martin County to live or anything like that. And the other part is family. Family being here has been a big part, because we're all together, we're close, and we, we do everything together, even to this day. That's the last question I'm going to ask you, Jeff, is about work-life balance. What advice would you give to your kids about how to differentiate themselves as far as how much time I'm going to spend at work, how much time I'm going to spend with the family, and what do you think 
are some of the key things that you learned about your experience? Well, I probably learned the hard way more than the, the right way. You know, I've done my share of 100-hour weeks, and it's, it's kind of fun. I tell my guys, uh, I've told my kids, and I tell the younger people that work for me that I had uh, bypass surgery back in probably about eight years, seven, eight years ago. And I always kid with them. I say, I earned that bypass <laughs> back in those days, you know, from putting in long hours and really working hard. But one of the things that was really important to me, I really sacrificed my career after I left Arthur Anderson, recognizing the importance of, of spending time with family. I decided to do the local firm thing. It was kind of the, was the reason. I knew that in order to be able to survive financially, you have to work hard. The other part was is I wanted to be able to have control of my time. So it really wasn't that I put in any less hours, but it was just a matter of if I needed to go in, I would go to work at 5, 36 o'clock in the morning. I would work till 4 o'clock. I would then take off and go coach my kids at whatever it was, you know, have dinner with them. And then I might go back into the office and work till midnight again. And I did that, you know, and I worked a lot of hours doing that. And I, I've really been thankful that uh, my son once told me, he said, Dad, you know, I know you worked all those hours, but he said, you know, it seemed like you were always there and when it counted. And, and I really think that that's the advice is it's, it's not only the number of times and the amount of hours you spend, but it's the quality of the times and making sure that those times are placed first when it is important to be there for your family. The other thing that was, was really important to us from a family standpoint is my wife was, was a homemaker and uh, really was fully involved with the, the children. And that was a goal that we had from the beginning. It cost us financially tremendously, but it was a commitment that we made and uh, we just did with less. Those were the things I would, I would challenge everybody to think about because too often they're gone too soon. I am so glad that I prioritized that time. Jeff, great advice. Uh, be there when you are needed to be there for your family. This has been a great podcast. My name again is Kerry Stamp. I've had Jeff Leslie, the CEO of ITS Fiber, on the podcast with me today. What a wonderful conversation that we've had. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Business in Paradise Palm Beach podcast with Kerry Stamp founder of Carrie Stamp and Company, Principal Wealth Advisors. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Commonwealth Financial Network. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Cary Stamp & Company is located at 110 Bridge Road, Tequesta, Florida, 33469. Securities and advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network member FINRA SIPC, a registered investment advisor. Thank you.